right, good afternoon. My name is Josh Harrison. I'm a member of the Board of Trustees here at the Columbus Metropolitan Club. Today's forum, Libraries, Unorthodox Roles, and Award-Winning Architecture, is brought to us with support from Puffin Foundation West and the Columbus Foundation Group, and in partnership with Columbus Metropolitan Libraries and the Ohio Library Council, each rep represented by many friends and associates here today. Uh, please join me in thanking them for their support. Libraries are a civic point of pride for many communities. According to an analysis of U.S. library attendance by Pew Research Center, millennials use libraries more than any other generation. As a result, library services and spaces have evolved to appeal to digitally native generation. While everything else about libraries has changed, one tradition has remained the same, the art of making the library an architectural centerpiece so that within these impressive public spaces, a community's thirst for knowledge, adventure, and entertainment, and research can be quenched. Please welcome our panel. CEO of the Columbus Metropolitan Library, Patrick Wazinski. <laughs> Executive Director of the Dayton Metro Library, Tim Kombich. <laughs> President and architectural designer at Moody Nolan, Jonathan Moody. and the Executive Director of the Ohio Library Council, Michelle Francis. <laughs> Michelle, the floor is yours. <laughs> Perfect timing, thank you, Josh. Um, thank you all so much and thank you to the Columbus um, Metropolitan Club for inviting us and for having us today. Uh, we're very excited to highlight and to talk about and discuss Ohio's public libraries. Um, as you know, Ohioans love their public libraries. Uh, just a few stats for you as we get started. We have in Ohio the highest public library use per capita in the nation. Uh, that's the latest information from the Institute of Museum and Library Sciences. With 8.5 million 8.5 million registered borrowers. We are first in the nation. We are also first in the nation per capita when it comes to library visits. So again, Ohioans love their public libraries. So with that, we're actually gonna kick it off. Um, the first question we have for our panel, our distinguished panel, we know that historically libraries have been a source of access uh, for books and for sharing of educational resources for local communities. How has that evolved and expanded in your opinion? Who wants to start? Patrick, well, uh, you can start. Okay, um, well first off, just uh, when Michelle talks about um, the best libraries in the country, it comes from the highest level of support. We wouldn't have the libraries we have without your support. So I want you to give yourselves a round of applause for what you've accomplished um, in this community and, and in communities throughout the state. Um, so there's a, a favorite line that we were using in designing our 10 new buildings that we stole from the Knight Foundation, and that was the last generation of libraries were built for collections, and this generation has to be built for connections. And uh, I, that was just, um, it was so inspirational for us to hear that because it's really about creating spaces for individuals along with all of the things that they used to come into the library for. So that's, that's the stacks, that's the, the collections, it's the technology. But most importantly, it's a space uh, where people feel welcome and comfortable. And so you see in our spaces today, broad open vistas. And uh, also within those broad open vistas, we try to create intimacy uh, for study rooms and quiet areas to really give people choices. Um, but that's the physical part of what we're doing. 10, 15 years ago, we weren't talking about you downloading ebooks from our website. 
So that's happening 24 seven outside of the library. And it, it's really driven uh, one of our strategies around really trying to make the library experience a very personal one. I always say the library that I grew up, the librarian made all the rules and her response if I didn't like those rules was to leave. Uh, <laughs> but it's a, it's a very different world today and um, we try to be uh, responsive. But it's also, uh, I'll add on that, Go ahead. Uh, Patrick, is that uh, when uh, people make these comments like, oh, it's not your grandmother's library, I always kind of push back from that. Because I think what happens is that we've been trying to expand the range of things that we can have impact in our community. But one of the things that we never have forgotten is why we've had the success that we've had. It's been people coming in and using our libraries for oftentimes very traditional purposes. And as a matter of fact, as we've been doing the design on our buildings, one of the key things that we've been promising and delivering on has been making certain that those people that do, the grandmothers that came in, uh, started using libraries back in the, in the 20s and the 30s, they're the same ones that we want to make certain are just as comfortable in their libraries so that we have things like quiet reading rooms, that we have actually lowered the bookshelves to heights so that they can actually reach them and that they have wider aisles so they can get by in their uh, strollers and the like. So those are elements that we try to retain while we look at what some of the new things that we're trying to do. Definitely, and from a physical standpoint, um, you know, yeah, I think we all have a memory of some librarian shushing us or kind of, you know, saying, yeah, this is a closed and you can't get this book unless you really need it and that kind of thing. Uh, you know, they had historically been kind of closed and dark and, and quiet, right? Like, shh, don't, don't, don't talk in the library. But um, it's amazing he can design after that trauma <laughs> that he experienced <laughs> as a child. I, I designed from the trauma, but no. <laughs> <laughs> no, but no, but the truth is um, the list of needs that the libraries have to serve has grown um, and the list of people that the library has served has, has stayed the same as well and grown and diversified. Uh, diversity means everybody. It means young kids, it means preschool kids, all the way up through grandmothers and, and boomers and retirees and people who just want to get together for a book club and everybody in between. So the balance is trying to find a way, how do we how do we embrace that? How do we welcome that? And how do we kind of encourage those people to want to come together and connect and interact? Uh, I add one more piece because we talk about design through the uh, physical space, but what about through policy? And I can tell you that our board of trustees are the ones that brought, it, brought this to us, and that was, it's really quite, uh, it's just wrong that we have many children with blocked library cards because of overdue fines hitting a threshold. So what are we really accomplishing if children are blocked from checking out material? And so um, the Find Free program, I know all of you enjoy it, but it was really uh, directed at kids to make sure that uh, we had as wide and open of access as policy. I don't think you would have, um, well, you didn't see that. Uh, 20 years ago, and now um, there's a number of libraries that are following suit. One of the things that I think happens with libraries is that we've tried really hard to create a great customer experience, and I think your Columbus Library uh, is a great example of that from how you're greeted in your libraries. I've visited many times. You have a great library here. Uh, one of the things that uh, metrics-wise that we try to track is you know things like circulation and uh, visitors and things like that, but one that we've been uh, I've been saying that we really ought to be tracking is how many kids are leaving the library crying? Because we see an uptick in that, a pretty substantial one. Now we don't actually count it, but I really wish I did know that just because we see them coming in having a great experience because of the educational media that we have and the toys and things like that that uh, our staff are engaging the kids with. Um, and uh, they are definitely leaving uh, wanting to stay and their parents are kind of dragging them out the door. <laughs> So that's a great segue, uh, actually, to the next question that I had. Um, for purposes of libraries today, and in many cases, it seems like they are the anchors of their local communities, um, and the, the role of libraries has changed. Um, Libraries as community gathering locations. I mean, obviously, as Jonathan mentioned, diversity, all these different groups are coming in. 
Talk to me a little bit about how that works, how you are designing the spaces and thinking about, um, you know, responding uh, to those needs and to the different groups. And I'm actually going to start with Jonathan on that yeah, one. I, I kind of saw that coming. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the things um, that, that is a part of the charge um, is that each of these libraries serves a different community um, and each of them needs to be unique because of and reflect the community that they serve. Um, so there's, there's a lot of history. There's a lot of um, honestly passion that comes behind that and a lot of the, the conversation and dialogue we have at a community level is a reflection of that passion from the community. I, I remember when we were working on the Near East Side trying to figure out um, how to pull together a Martin Luther King Library. Um, I remember seeing a piece of, you know, on one of the PBS channels about Columbus neighborhoods um, and it, it talked about the history of Columbus and it talked about, um, it, it talked about basically what happened to the Near East Side as once vital um, African-American community and hub. And really, there were some very clear markers. Um, basically, um, 71 got built, right, and disconnected the East Side from downtown. Um, and then somewhere around 70s, 80s, you, you introduced drugs into the community. And people who once were active and out visually policing their uh, streets on their porch um, all of a sudden, they didn't like what they were seeing on their street, and they kind of turned away from that, and they kind of stopped using their porch. And when you drive down Long Street, it was this amazing, Pat likes to tell me, you know, make sure you stay safe and all that, but I remember taking a video, and, and I was the driver um, <laughs> while I was taking the video. I, 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 had, I had at least one hand on the wheel, <laughs> um, but it, it was just this amazing rhythm of, of architecture, which was, you know, porch, 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 porch. And then there was an opening where the library site was gonna be, and then there was East High School. So one of the things that we thought would be a helpful way of thinking about, you know, tying together the history of the community, tying together architecture, and really kind of reversing that trend of people not wanting to look out at the street, was to say, how can we incorporate the idea of a porch into a library? How can we create a reading room or a space where people want to sit out and look out and see what's happening? in their community and be a part of it and participate, rather than it being kind of a detriment or something that people want to hide from. And he succeeded. If you've been to the Martin Luther King Library, that's exactly what happens there. Tim? You know, well, one of the things that we start off all of our projects, and we, we had a major bond issue in uh, 2012 that has funded us being able to either replace, upgrade, expand, or at least renovate um, all of our locations, and we've been busy working on trying to do that. And so we've had a lot of community conversations about what their community's aspirations are for their library. What is it they're hoping um, this library will help celebrate? And so the very first meeting that we have with the community we don't even really even talk about architecture per se, but we talk about the community and what it is that they want to celebrate in their library. And I've heard this several times since we've opened many of our new libraries. Boy, you guys really did listen to that first meeting and told it where we told you what we wanted because they could point out several things in the design that really did help make for that um, to become a reality. Michelle, I, I think I, I'm going to go one step uh, higher than just the community gathering space and get this as a librarian. I'm going to recommend a book to you, right? <laughs> uh, it's Palaces for the People by Eric Kleinenberg, and it's how social infrastructure can help fight inequality, polarization, and decline of civic life. Now, how often do you think of public libraries as being part of our infrastructure but our social infrastructure. And I think that's exactly what we have in the network of buildings in Columbus. Uh, um, to get your attention, and, and not to spoil the whole story, but he talks about the, the heat wave in Chicago in 1995, where almost 750 people died, and you had poor, crime-ridden, segregated neighborhoods next to one another where some experienced some of the highest per capita death others none and what was present in those communities where the death toll was close to zero was a strong social infrastructure so he talks about the importance of parks the importance of libraries the importance of community centers and i think today when you 
If you think about a, an era of the greatest social network tools that we have to stay in touch, what do we do? We mainly talk to people who agree with us, right? But where do we bring people together in the community? Where do we create that safe space uh, for after school or um, the summertime? It, it's really in our public library network. And so um, it, maybe that's thinking about libraries the, and, and the traditional work we've been doing in a very uh, different level or at a very different level. No, I, I think it's great. And actually, ironically, Pat brought his copy and I brought my copy too. So we are more than happy and they are available at your local public library. So. There's 16 copies, four were, uh, I checked right before I left. Four available. Yeah. So um, obviously taking off from that social infrastructure and the open community space that, that, that public libraries provide today, many of the library services are expanding more into the area of social services. Um, and again, based on the needs of their local communities and because each branch is, a, is in response, the services they provide into their local communities. So what is that role? And then, uh, and that's really primarily for, for Pat and Tim as far as the social services. And then uh, for Jonathan as a follow-up, how is it that the design of the library is impacted based on the social services that are being provided? I think uh, libraries have always um, looked at their role in the community as having been successful when they are helping other people be successful. I mean, that's a, a good part of what we do. Seeing a lot of the organizations in our community that have uh, need a lot of help, I only have to think about this past summer where we've had over 3,000 homes and businesses either partially or completely destroyed due to the tornadoes. The amount of opportunity that the library had to provide space for social service agencies, the Red Cross, uh, we would have just lines of people coming in just to be able to get the internet access, some of the things that they, uh, they lost from their homes there. It was really quite evident of that as well. But I think one of the things that I, I noticed, uh, particularly the success of our, our urban branches, where we had a lot of these older branches, were small, they were close to uh, uh, populations, they had uh, only a very a small uh, footprint that they were responsible for serving. But because they were so small, they did not have uh, meeting rooms. They did not have separate spaces for teens or even uh, in some cases it felt like it for the children, that they were just like one room schoolhouses for libraries. And that uh, we bit the bullet when we went out for our bond issue. We told the people in these three neighborhoods, we're going to ask you to give up your little local library and you're going to have to go a mile further to get to the library that you deserve. And it was a long conversation that we had, and we had those continued conversations about that. But we opened our new Northwest branch, which was, you know, about six size, six times the size of any one of those three smaller ones. But because of the efficiency of the space and the amenities of the meeting spaces that they could use after hours, the, the, the size of the collections, the, the fact that they actually had parking spaces to them, were all the kinds of things that drew people there. And uh, you know, while there's a couple historic buildings that people want to know, well, what's the future of those historic buildings? They've embraced these new libraries because they can do the wide range of things, and the, many of that, many of those things include helping the social service agencies in our community come in, use our facilities to engage in their with their clients uh, directly, and using our facilities. It's a, a space where uh, people feel comfortable, and I don't think people sometimes appreciate that about libraries, that they are seen as the, uh, the Switzerland of social service agencies, <laughs> that there's not this, uh, you know, uh, the library is invading my turf by hosting this, uh, this meeting or these organizations bring people in um, and their clients feel comfortable coming because they appreciate and, and trust the library. Um, well, I think it's, it's well stated, Tim. I, I guess uh, I, I'll go to some of the comments I've heard from time to time about, I'm not really comfortable about this changing role of the library. You're, you seem to be taking on very different services that are really not a part of your core. Well, um, first of all, just to let you know, our book circulation remains uh, steady. It's about 15 million. That's about 12 million physical items, 3 million digital downloads. Um, but 
we all know that the middle class in this country is probably bearing most of the brunt of the changes that we're seeing in society. And they are coming into our libraries many times desperate for services and not exactly knowing where to turn. So I look at that and say, well, in 20 years ago, we would help someone find the population of Des Moines, mm -hmm. but is this equally or more important as we're helping people who are uh, desperate uh, and, and in need of assistance and, and largely referral. I don't want to sell it that we're the ones providing those services, but how do we create and have systems in place so we have a social worker at the main library that's grant funded for about 20 hours a week. We have someone who does legal aid. These folks are coming in on a steady basis in all of our libraries. and. The one thing you know about um, library workers is they are committed to serving the public, and that's what the public needs, and I think um, until that situation turns around, I would expect those people are going to be, be comfortable and are going to uh, seek out public libraries, and we're going to help them to the best of our ability. Jonathan? Yeah. Uh, so, again, uh, there's a much broader population and there's a much broader set of needs. Um, and what it really means from a design standpoint um, is, is there needs to be a lot more flexibility. Um, and the truth is, and I say this kind of, you know, taking ego out of it, but it, it becomes less and less about architecture. Um, it becomes more about, like, what are the needs and how can we help to serve those needs better? What are the physical things that you need to put in place to help meet those needs and it needs to be flexible spaces because you don't know whether someone's coming in to try and find a job or if they're trying to find homework help or if they don't have any child care options or if they do want to look up the capital of Iowa. Um, it, it, it needs to be all of those things. Um, so what it, it means we push a lot more things that had traditionally been architecture um, into furniture um, so that you know you can change the furniture over time. It means when we look at spaces, they need to be flexible and adaptable so that one day it can be a meeting room, the next day it can be an office space, the next day it can be an educational seminar room, but it has to be designed flexible. And the truth is, it, it might have to be all of those things in the future, and it might, you know, might have to double the size of a children's area or double the size of meeting rooms. So it's, we need to design the spaces because the one thing we know about the future is we don't know. <laughs> um, so we have to design them flexible and adaptable. The exciting part um, in terms of the challenge is how do you do that in such a way that it still excites people um, and makes them want to come in and use the branch? That reminds me of us when we were first uh, conceptualizing what all we wanted to do because we had this opportunity to rethink the entire system and how we could accomplish that. And we wanted to future-proof our libraries. We wanted to make certain that they could serve uh, our community, not just now what, what we understand, but what's that next library service is going to come? What are those things that, uh, that residents are going to want from us that uh, we need to be able to be able to responsive to? And one of the things that we came up with was uh, uh, Something that has been involved in what we or evolved now is what we call our opportunity spaces. And they may look like a meeting room, and sometimes they're a little rougher in terms of their design with, you know, just concrete floors and, uh, and power coming out of, the ce out of the ceiling. But one of the things we've done with those spaces there, we've turned those over to nonprofit organizations that align with our mission and have them just take over that space and let them do what they want to do with that space, um, not just for a day like most meeting rooms get used, um, or even a few hours, um, but for weeks or even months at a time, to let them explore their mission to expand upon the things that they're trying to accomplish, use the visibility, the early numbers that we talked about, to began this conversation with, the number of people that come into our buildings every day from all walks of life there is a perfect uh, way for organizations to get exposure and for them to be able to see what's going on with their mission. And uh, so we've been turning those spaces over free uh, to a lot of these organizations. Uh, think of it as a uh, nonprofit incubator space. And this has been something that has really been quite successful and we have a clamoring list of people that are wanting to take advantage of them uh, because we don't have them at every location. Um, but it is a, an opportunity for us to integrate ourselves and what the community's demands are and also to provide those spaces that we can uh, use those for library purposes when we need to. Yeah. I 
Gilgamesh. No, I, I told Tim, it's funny, my first time in one of the new Dayton libraries um, was actually uh, at the Funk Museum um, because they were a group that was kind of starting off a museum and they were like, hey, we, we, we don't know where we're going, but we're trying to figure it out along the way. And right now we're occupying one of these spaces um, in a Dayton library until we figure that out. So I was like, wow. That's a great way of kind of leveraging um, a public resource um, to really offer someone the opportunity to grow. Is he eligible for a Dayton library card? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, the, just to give everyone context, um, because you've heard the story about well, are we going to need libraries, are people still uh, wanting to support libraries in the future? Um, Columbus, is, that's 137 million in 10 new projects, uh, the brochure that you have at your, uh, at your chairs today. Dayton is 187 million of new libraries, and if you haven't seen their new central library, I mean, we're, we're very proud of ours in, in Columbus, but it's just a stunning building. Uh, Cuyahoga and Cleveland are split. There's a city and a county library system up there. Each uh, 100 million in new libraries. Cincinnati is working on their master plan. I, I think we are the community centers of, uh, of this generation and I, I think people see what libraries are capable of and maybe embodied on what they put on the front door of the main Carnegie Library in 1907, open to all. So as far as uh, library spaces today and providing um, public services, and this is kind of start, I'd like to start off with Jonathan uh, for this one. How are public libraries different from other public entities that provide services? Um, so how they are different, because they are, there's a similar need in terms of um, when you look at um, schools or rec centers or other types of community centers, they're, they're, those are all public spaces that people gather. Um, but really, it's, they have different types of resources, um, and they have a different way of connecting people. And really, you know, part of how we are working to design them you know, for now and in the future is we want people to be aware that that's happening. You want to put that activity on display so you want to you know have a visible person who walks by and sees what's happening at the library to see it be open and to see people together and in their collaborating and learning and sharing with those resources um, because you know you don't necessarily you you kind of want to see what's happening in a gym maybe right but <laughs> right but at the same time you don't want a basketball going through a glass wall right um, you know schools are you know schools are great learning spaces but at the same time like I, I know my six-year-old I want them to be focused so I don't necessarily I, I, you might want people looking in but you definitely don't want the kids looking out and get distracted so um, really libraries put all that on display and I, I think the one thing is they really want you know iconic is a buzzword that Pat uses a lot because you want to do something that pulls people in and draws them and makes them say hey what is going on in there what am, what am I missing out on so, I think that library on show is something you really uh, want to do inside the buildings as well. Um, that uh, one of the things that I think makes libraries unique is the fact that we are oftentimes serving these dispersed uh, communities simultaneously and it's oftentimes with a family uh, where the adults are there the teens are there they've brought their young kids with them and so trying to make the spaces feel as open and as accessible as possible uh, the meeting spaces and the like so that they everybody has a place they find as being their home at the library uh, one person uh, I remember quoted so I just feel smarter when I walk in the library, you know? <laughs> so to be able to provide that opportunity on the outside uh, for them to uh, want to come in and feel smarter and then for them to take advantage of it when they do come. We, we talk about um, what we do, of course, inside the building, but I, I also challenge us to think a little bit larger about what's happening because when we were designing the main library, and if you haven't seen the connection to Topiary Park and the plaza, um, put that on your list of things to do because Topiary Park is such a hidden jewel in our community. But we told our architects um, that we wanted the library plus, and the plus was civic space. 
and I can't necessarily define what civic space means as it relates to the library, but if you go out and look at the main library, they, ac they absolutely, um, they hit it on the mark. And it's just now a pass-through. If you talk to Dave Kaufman, the retiring um, CEO of Motorist now in COVA, Dave said part of what prompted them to uh, invest in the new apartments along Topiary Park was the amenity of the library that now had the exposure um, to Topiary Park and seeing so many more people who are there. So how often do we think of public libraries as economic catalysts for what's happening? Uh, the other example I'll give you is, uh, of course, Dublin. And uh, Dublin has a, a plaza. We just hosted the Hyperloop out there a couple, and so where did people gather? We said, come to the library. They could do all of that outside, but we said the truest test to the success of the new Dublin Library was last weekend, it was overflowing with high school students taking homecoming pictures. <laughs> so uh, you know you've hit it when that's the space they want to be in. So I do want to touch on that briefly for just a second because we were actually talking over lunch, uh, Jonathan and I were, about shared spaces. And so like you were talking about the topiary park. In, in many communities, more and more, we are seeing these shared spaces as a library, a part of that. Um, Jonathan, can you touch on that a little bit? Yeah, and, and Kat, Pat used the word catalyst as well. Um, I, I don't, I don't want to like bash on them, but um, like, um, <laughs> Part of how developers, because we talk about economic engines and growing communities and kind of building from there, part of how developers begin to think about things is based on leasable space, right? So what that means is you don't, you know, an, an amenity space is not something you can lease out to people who are renting apartments. So they struggle with kind of how do we, how do we justify or how do we encourage people to want to live in an apartment or in a neighborhood or in a place um, without kind of the amenities to draw them in. What libraries help to do, because they're, they're very specifically located and targeted um, in, in great neighborhoods, Pat mentioned motorists and other communities, um, they become that amenity or that shared space that people can build apartments around and nearby and say, hey, I can spend the money to invest in units because I know that people will walk and use a library nearby. It, it is absolutely a catalyst for growth. And if I could real quick, because I know I'm going to, I want to go to Tim on this one too, but before I do that, I, I'm going to get in trouble if I don't do this. So we're actually going to move to audience questions in just a few minutes. So um, if you'll start to make your way towards the microphone, uh, we will get to your questions in just a few minutes. But I do want to have Tim, if you can, because obviously in this space and talking about an economic driver and how important the library has been to your local community, because I know I've witnessed it first hand uh, being over in Dayton. Well, there's a couple things. One is there's obviously the, the adjoining properties. They enjoy the fact that there's this big uh, oftentimes multi-million dollar investment being uh, made next door and they, they enjoy that. But you look around some of the facilities, in particular our downtown library, where we've seen large, uh, a large public investment that has really um, generated a lot of other investments by um, you know, the, the apartment, um, the condos, the, um, the businesses that moved downtown and bought uh, an almost empty building and renovated it. And just to see that kind of uh, of investment near your site. Um, and it's not just at the, the main library. We saw that at some of our branches as well that um, the, uh, in some of our neighborhoods where nobody has uh, seen a crane for decades. For the library to be building is, has a big impact on the community and really does help um, them feel better about their own community and what can go on. And we've seen, uh, you know, neighbors fixing up their houses because they know that they think that they can uh, now get this, something out of that investment there. Um, and as one board member said when we were negotiating with them for a property next to one of their high schools. She says, you know, there's just something that you say to the community when you do something new. And it really does, it's as simple as that. When you do something new for a community and what our library investment has been has been one of those things that uh, uh, people feel this immense amount of pride towards in, in their particular neighborhoods. Well, and uh, also don't underestimate the importance of allowing loitering. Right, you can loiter in a library. We actually encourage it. That's a that's a really good thing. But in, in all seriousness, 
to have a space where there's no expectation of commerce exchange, that's a civic space and that's a value. Uh, you know, I'll use Dublin again as the example. All the restaurants, all of the activity all around us, but where can people gather either um, for solo pursuits or with a team, it, it's in the library. And I can actually attest to that as a Dublin branch resident right. because I've tried to reserve a meeting room space for um, this past week and they were booked solid um, for a full week. So, I mean, that space is... So the trustees want to hear that we didn't yeah. build it big enough. Thank <laughs> you, Michelle. Thank you. No, it's being heavily utilized. And I will say, even on social media and, and what I love about today, and, and Pat mentioned this about the, the high school students taking the homecoming pictures, we see that all over social media and the love for libraries as a public space, uh, which is so, so wonderful. So with that said, um, we are now going to be begin the Q&A portion of today's uh, conversation. So, it is CMC's tradition to take audience questions. Please state your name and ask your question. Please avoid editorial comments and remember questions end with a question mark. Let's get started. And I've always, I've come to these for years and I've always wanted to say that. So, <laughs> so let's get started. First question. And um, I'd like to thank all of you for being here today and for an, a very engaging conversation. I've loved libraries since I was a very small child. Um, and it's fascinating to me to see what's happened over the years uh, and the way libraries have changed. But what I didn't know, Pat, when I read this is that you are an elected member of the International Federation of Library Associations Governing Board, headquartered in The Hague, Netherlands. This must give you some opportunity to find out what international trends are taking place. Could you comment a little bit about what we're seeing um, in other parts of the world with regard to libraries? Can we first recognize my 92-year-old mother's marketing efforts here and <laughs> her ability to get that to you, Carol? <laughs> well, um, whether or not all of you know, we hosted the International Federation of Library Association World Congress here in 2016, where we had 3,000 librarians from 130 countries. And that's not only because of the great libraries, and by the way, uh, Delaware is here, Worthington is here, Bexley, you all benefit from the fact that the collegial activity that we all have, we all uh, honor each other's cards and try to make it seamless um, for all of you, and they do a terrific job. They were a part of it. But we have a strong library and information sector with OCLC and chemical abstracts. You may not think about that. You put it all together and it's a real uh, asset for our community. What you see um, are strong libraries in Europe, similar to what we might see in the US, but I think what's most, um, uh, for me, the, the greatest impact was people struggling in developed, developing countries to try to bring the concept of a library to their community and how hard it is to actually do that. Um, and then just some of the other challenges you see, um, President Erdogan in Turkey destroyed 150,000 books from the university library, right? And when you start to hear those stories, you just come back and you have such, such uh, reverence and appreciation for what we've done really well in this country. Um, but it's also just very inspiring because struggling as they may be, they are committed to the concept of sharing resources, they are committed to the concept and understand that bringing technology into some of the remote, uh, most remote parts of the world uh, is a very laudable goal. So um, it was very inspiring to be a part, and my term just ended in September. So <laughs> thank you, Carol. Hi, I'm Kate Whitfield. Um, I love libraries, but in the past year, I've only ever been once or twice, and the reason is I discovered the joy of online borrowing. You put your card in once, and book after book seamlessly. I don't even have to leave my couch. So I probably borrowed more books in the last year than the past 20 years. So my question is, I've often thought, am I harming or helping my local library by borrowing all these books online and not physically going? 
So if you could describe the positive and negative impact as the, through the growth of online borrowing financially and the use of space and so on. Well, I'll, I'll take a little stab at that. One of them is the fact that people have said, well, well, the internet, that's really making it more difficult for libraries, but we're internet consumers ourselves, and so we use the internet uh, in our business, and so as new technologies like downloadable uh, audiobooks and ebooks have uh, come into popularity there we are more kind of media agnostics you know we want you to be connected we're in the business not of lending physical books or ebooks we're in you know, the business of making you more successful as an individual helping you um, learn to help your kids learn so whatever way we help you do that we're going to be successful at doing that but if you're not taking advantage of the library for so many of the other things that we do, um, you're missing out. So you should come and visit, uh, even if it's not to borrow books. Yeah. Pat, do you, oh, Jonathan, go ahead, sorry. Well, I, selfishly, I kind of think it's just a smart investment. <laughs> I don't know that I can speak to the positive or negative. I had this great epiphany as I used to be a, an avid airport, like, oh man, that looks like a cool book. And I go on Amazon and say, I'm gonna buy it. And then I had this epiphany while working on projects. And I'm like, you know those same books, you know, like Palaces for People that you buy on Amazon, you can get from the library. <laughs> <laughs> And then my brother pointed out, you know, my parents are, at my, my parents, they're right over there and they're avid um, uh, books on tape checker outers, if that's a term. <laughs> um, but it, they are, it, my brother pointed out um, that it's actually, you know, all of these projects that we're talking about are bond projects. So it actually is our investment working for us. So it's actually just in my, it's a wise use of investment dollars that we've already paid. Well, and I would just go back and say that's our efforts to try to personalize this service because if we weren't engaged in that kind of activity and downloading, the people say, well, the world is starting to pass you by. Um, I'm guessing most people in the audience don't know this, but the high water mark for ebook sales was 2013. That's when the Kindle came out and the Nook, and there was all the flurry towards ebooks. It's actually down a billion dollars in actual revenue since 2013. Now, I don't think that means ebooks are going away. I just think it really shows that um, all formats are, are still alive and, and doing well. Here's but we'll, we'll real, expect real, to see you soon. Yeah. <laughs> and real quick factoid and then get to the next questioner uh, is the fact that we did polling to de demonstrate that our bond promise was reaching uh, our re residents. And so one of the questions we asked all of our likely voters was, uh, what do you think of the future of the libraries? Do you think they're going to be more important in five years or less important? 75% of them said it was more important and a large number said about the same and only a small fraction of people actually think that libraries will be less important. And just to kind of put the whole ebook um, electronic conversation into uh, perspective, last year, according to, because we track, libraries track everything, we try to, um, our circulation last year, and this is for downloadable, streamed, everything, and physical borrowing in the state of Ohio, we had 195 million circulations. Of that 195 million, 100, of the 195, 22.7 million was ebooks and audiobooks. So circulation is still very strong. Mariba. Um, my, I'm Mariba Mansfield. I'm a deacon in the Episcopal Church. And I heard you address um, libraries as gathering spaces. And I heard you say you encourage loitering. And I heard you say that um, you have some right? social <laughs> you have some social services that you provide in the library, and I'm wondering how you handle the issue of homeless people in the library, because you know you, you talk about being open to all, but I know um, that it's a it's a um, challenging issue, and I I'm just wondering about I think Columbus Metro passed a policy about limiting the size of items that you can b bring into the library. I don't know too much about that. I'm just wondering how you handle that very delicate issue in these um, beautiful libraries that you've built as main libraries, but also as neighborhood libraries, too, because you've, you've built wonderful libraries in poor neighborhoods that have allowed access. So I'm wondering how you handle the issue of homeless people in the libraries. Yeah, uh, Mirab, I actually thank you for the question, because it's a good question, and it's a serious question. And when we talk about libraries being in the center of our communities, 
homelessness is so uh, prevalent and challenging in our communities. First of all, I'm gonna go back to some of our core principles around being open to all. So the fact that you are homeless is, you are still welcome in the, in the main library and all of the libraries. In fact, part of what we try to do on really cold mornings in the winter is open the lobby areas at the main library a little bit earlier in recognizing that we're going to have some homeless who need a, a place to go after the shelter closes. Um, we have uh, what we call a code of conduct in terms of uh, the behavioral expectations that we have for everyone, regardless of their position in life. And um, it, it applies to all. We think it's fair. It, it um, seems to work for our homeless as well. The issue that you mentioned about the size of bag is just the, the quantity and the space, and that's just a, a safety issue. Um, and then we, we just try to, to be attentive to the needs of the homeless because sometimes we can tell they might need um, a bath or a shower. And so our security officers have information about where they can refer the homeless to help them or food. So it's a little bit of that intertwined mission that we have of serving the community as a whole. And um, I, I, we're actually pretty proud of um, the position that we take on serving the homeless. And, and the, the public library is, um, is maybe the place to get them back on their feet as well. Yeah, and I would just I would just add that the uh, the libraries going back to how we're perceived in the community. Um, I think our respectful nature um, is one of the things that serves us well in this arena. Uh, that we definitely want to uh, engage people and help them. And oftentimes, uh, some of the interactions they have with their librarians it may be the only respectful um, interaction that they will have all day long. And so, uh, certainly, as Patrick has mentioned, uh, trying to connect them with appropriate services and the like is a, uh, a useful step for us to do that. Um, but I think it's really valuable for libraries and for people who use them from all walks of life to come in and to interact, as I think Pat mentioned earlier, just to see people of different walks of life in different stature of uh, economic uh, um, condition, to be able to uh, uh, interact and see each other. I mean, I think that's good for us as uh, individuals and as a community. Hi, my name's Trip Lazarus, um, and I actually volunteer um, up at the Northern Lights Library at the Homework Help Center, um, and get to see firsthand what a, an unbelievable equalizer that is. I mean, these are kids, a lot of them have parents that don't speak English. Um, they couldn't get the help uh, they need any, anywhere else, really. Um, which makes me curious about other things that the libraries are doing to be great equalizers and things like, I'm just curious, are there things going on like um, job training? I mean, we have such, there, there are a lot of jobs available and a lot of people without skills to fill those jobs that are living on the margins uh, because, because, you know, everything's changing around them. So I'm wondering, uh, what is the library's role as kind of a, a great equalizer, at least of opportunity, you know, equal opportunity for all? It's very much a part of what uh, I think most of us uh, larger libraries do and uh, other libraries around the country do about being able to uh, to help people be successful and oftentimes it's not about them um, just giving them a book but trying to connect them with the right kind of services, whether those are training uh, opportunities and the like or whether it's uh, just helping them do their resume, you know, helping them navigate. When somebody comes in with their phone in their hand and they're, they're trying to find a job at McDonald's McDonald's, think about trying to navigate when you type in McDonald's and job. Are you ever going to find a place where you could actually fill in an application? I would, I bet none of us could do it. Um, but our staff, and those are some great people that can really sit down one-on-one, -on -one, kind of walk them through some of the processes that help them uh, be successful. And a lot of times it is that one-on-one -on -one interaction between a librarian and an individual that helps that person become more successful. Pat, if I, oh, go ahead. I was just gonna say, I know you have some boot camps and free entrepreneurial classes coming up, don't you? Uh, well, we do, and uh, we wanna thank um, Cover My Meds, um, who provided a large grant, and they're gonna have a strong presence in Franklinton. Mm -hmm. 
And um, their conversation and challenge to us was, we'd like you to help us train some of the chronically unemployed, underemployed in Franklinton to get jobs in our call center, in our food service, just some basic skills. And for an employer to step forward and to recognize that the library has that capability. And oh, by the way, they don't, they said, we don't care if these folks go off to other employers. This is what we're trying to give back for the community. Why do they choose the library? Because it's back to that um, comment about Switzerland. It is the place where people will come in and, and you're not walking through and picking a number. You're coming in to a, a smiling face. Last thing I'll say is we've, we've enjoyed a, an economic boom for, what, a, almost a decade? But in 2008, during the crash, the very <clears throat> homework help center where <clears throat> Trip worked or volunteers uh, was one of one that we turned, we turned all of them into um, daytime job help centers. And for three years, we had 40,000 people register each year for job help. Not that we provided, but with, in partnership with others. So we have the ability to facilitate the work of so many other nonprofits in our community. And I think that's one of the strengths that we bring as well. I know sometimes at the State House we get questions all the time about libraries today and providing those resources and, and getting the message out and providing those opportunities. So with that said, I am going to now turn it back over to Josh. I hope you enjoyed the forum. I know I found it interesting. We touched on areas I wasn't expecting, social services, international politics, <laughs> e-commerce. Uh, one more time, let's thank our sponsors, the Puffin Foundation West. And the, and the Columbus Foundation Group. <laughs> and in partnership with Columbus Metropolitan Libraries uh, and the Ohio Library Council. And let's thank our speakers one more time. Patrick Lazinski, Tim Kombuch, Jonathan Moody, Michelle Francis. <laughs> we look forward to seeing everyone next week. Thank you.